All right, first lightning talk is Ali Simji. He's going to talk about Busy Beaver, the Chicago Python Community Engagement Slack bot. Let's give him a round of applause. Hi, everybody. My name is Ali Sevji. I'm one of the organizers of the Chicago Python Users Group. And I'm here to talk to you about this community engagement initiative I've been working on for the past few months called Busy Beaver. So we're really fortunate to have a fantastic community of Pythonistas in the Windy City. And at the heart of this community is the Chicago Python Users Group, or Chippy. With over 4,600 members, Chippy is one of the largest tech-focused communities inside the United States. Uh, we've been around for 15 years, and in that time, we've had around 150 plus monthly meetings. In addition to our general meeting that happens once a month, we have a lot of special interest groups for more niche uh, interests. So we have one for data, web development slash DevOps, finance. We recently started one on algorithms and coding interviews to help people whiteboard. Uh, we have one for lunch, well, so people that can't make our evening meetups can attend that one. And we recently started doing some open source sprints. So last month, we sprinted on chippy.org. We also have a monthly project night. And this project night has two tracks. There's a challenge project night track. And here, there's a group of four people. They mob program on an assignment together. And we also have a BYO, bring your own project uh, track, where people just work on projects and they get help if they need it. We also have a world famous mentorship program. This is a 13 week one on one project based mentorship. There's two cohorts a year. Uh, there's around 20 to 30 people every single, uh, sorry, 20 to 30 pairs every single cohort. And at the end, the top 10 mentees present their lightning talks at a Chippy May meeting. The next one's gonna be on May, May 9th in Chicago. So if you're around, please come on by. It's gonna be a lot, a lot of fun. So like most organizations, Slack is our primary means of communication. And it's really become ingrained within our community. So we have a lot of channels focused on different conversations. Some of my favorites include book club. There's one for advent of code. And code review is always a lot of fun too. Slack has a lot of plugins. And we use these plugins quite extensively. But they don't really solve the, uh, the specific problem that we have. We're trying to build a tech-focused community, and we have a different set of problems. So trying to foster conversations around technology to keep people coming back. So our Slack is only as good as our integrations, only as good as our community. So nothing really fit, uh, fit our specific use case, so we got a team together, and we uh, let them loose on the problem. After a little bit of design and a lot of hard work, the end result was Busy Beaver, and it's a Slack bot uh, built specifically for the Chicago Python workspace. So the bot's mission is to increase engagement within the Chicago Python community. So that's a pretty broad scope. So what does it really mean? What are some ways we can engage your community? GitHub seems like a good place to start. It's a social coding platform. A lot of developers use GitHub. But as an organization, we didn't really have a lot of insight into what our uh, community was working on, what projects they were doing, what uh, open source contributions they were making, what things were they starting. So working with GitHub seemed like a good place to start. So the first feature we created was, uh, was a GitHub summary bot. And so what this did was, if you register uh, with this bot, every day at 2 o'clock, it goes out to GitHub, collects all your public activity in the last day, and it posts it within a channel. It got a lot of great publicity, mostly from me. So we decided to add another feature. Uh, over the past few months, the Chicago Python, at Chicago Python Twitter channel, it's becoming a little bit more popular. We're sharing more content. Uh, so we decided to integrate this within our, uh, within our Slack workspace. So the second feature we built was, since not everybody on Twitter, uh, on Slack follows us on Twitter, we just reshare our tweets inside of that one channel. So we were released in January. So far, we only have two features. But we are an open source project released under the MIT license. We have a lot of documentation showing how to get started contributing. Uh, we also have a project board with a lot of issues. I've been tagging them with a uh, good first issue, uh, how hard they are, how much effort they're going to take. There's also a CI CD pi uh, pipeline built in. So if you get a feature out there, write some tests, we can get it shipped into production really quickly. So if you want to start getting contributing, uh, look at our readme, join the chippy Slack. I'm going to be sprinting on this project Monday if anybody's around. I have stickers. If anyone wants to get stickers, there could be some out there. Find me. If you make a PR, I will give you a button. So there's, uh, so there's some incentive there. Uh, so thanks for your time. But before I go, I just want to acknowledge all my Chippy organizers. Couldn't be up here without all their hard work. And also to everybody on the Busy Weaver teams. Thank you, everybody.
I'm just holding the mic for you. Oh, you're, you're, you're low. Do you need to Yeah, who knew about computers? That looks great. That's a preview of slide number five, you all. All right. All right. Microphone? Yeah. Thank you. All, all right. right. Uh, Veronica is going to give us a talk about Get Hooked on Images and Up Your Documentation Game. Let's give her a round of applause. We're going to do a 30 minute talk in five minutes. Are you guys still hold on to your hats? All right. So how many of you use Git and GitHub for your programming files? Almost all of you. That's fabulous. OK, so how many of you have explored different ways of documenting your projects? Could be creative use of comments, man pages, images, anything. All right, all right, all right, all right. I see some hands. So. We talked a little bit about this earlier today. Um, remember our cat. We got to label our cat. So you could have ASCII to explain where you are in a particular piece of code. Um, you could create whole man pages describing sections of your code. But it's possible that some of these obvious comments aren't so obvious to you. So the best docs are the ones that help you. You need to learn to solve the problems that you have. And your problem solving is going to be with you throughout your careers, certainly longer than you know, any particular flavor of JavaScript. Um, and I'm a self-taught second career developer, and I managed to try on a lot of different hats. So today I'm going to talk about a problem that I encountered as I started to shift from scripting um, to front-end roles, how I developed a solution and you know how we can learn to build the tools that we wish we had. So this talk, while it's about tools, is really about opening yourself up to making the software you need to make your Git workflow work for you. Um, so not everyone uses Git the same way. So before I talk about my Git venture, I should tell you where I was when I got started. So, when I learned Git, I learned it the way many people do. A kind and loving friend told me, there are these five commands, OK? Don't ask me again. It's been 72 times that you've asked. Just write down the five commands. OK, OK, so maybe I got a little bit into that person's hair. Um, I never did a Git intensive. And everything that I've learned since then, I've learned as I've needed to do it. So as you can guess, when I started to work on my own projects, I was a little uncomfortable with the whole get time travel thing. Um, so I tried to keep things linear. So I could push, pull, check out. Um, but anything fancier than that didn't feel like it, you know, it kind of felt out of the question. Um, however, there's a lot of things you can do with Git. And I made a partial list right here. So at the time, I was relying, as I started to move to more visual work, I was continuing to rely on commit messages to guide this time travel. And I researched how to write good commit messages. Um, but because I was making these small visual changes, sometimes just color changes, do I add in hex values to my commits? Um, and I was making small changes and experimenting, and so I had a lot of trouble finding the right commit to makes. I started to wonder if there was a better way. Um, so I'm a super visual person. I've always been a super visual person. I, this is my second career. I used to be a geologist. We look at rocks. Rocks have orientations, and we take pictures of them, and we use these as documentation. 
Um, so as I was shifting, I started to look for ways that that visual documentation would show up. Um, one of my first open source projects was um, I was applying to Outreachy and I was trying to create a dashboard and I found myself really wishing as I was um, looking at these requests to know where the dashboard had been in the past because I was not only trying to learn a new language, yes, I tried to apply to Outreachy using a language I hadn't worked in before. Um, so I was trying to learn that new language, but I was also trying to kind of see where the dashboard had been. And so I talked to the developers and said, do we have screenshots of this? I'd really love to see it. And they said, well, no one does that. And I said, oh, wow, you know, like, there's a whole industry that doesn't think like me. How amazing does that feel? Um, so, you know, I could have felt kind of bad about that, but I realized that I wanted to make something in, is it five minutes already? It really is. It really is. That's All right. really depressing. Sorry, bro. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> is that talk online tonight? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. And you oh, like, like the full version of that talk is online, so you can also just <laughs> go and watch it. All right. It'll be good. I'll post it. So next up, Mason. Paul, are you sent to do a raffle press? Sorry about that. Come on. Another, we need another five minutes. Okay. We do have raffle prizes. We, our funny Python script to raffle them off is not, not happening today, I guess. <laughs> that, uh, the irony there is not lost on anybody. Anyone know a Python developer? Awesome. Ooh, that is really hyper contrast. Is this can you all hear me? Talk very right close to the mic. All right, so Mason's going to talk about TL's program, computer science in every high school. I love it. Uh, let's give him a round of applause. Okay, so in my talk earlier today, I mentioned that I am a volunteer for TL's, and I'm going to take this quick time to do a five minute spiel on what TL's is. So, TL's is a nationwide program that aims to pair industry professionals with teachers who do not have the experience that they need to be teaching computer science in high schools, but are being forced into these situations because of the demand for computer science educators. A lot of these statistics that I'm gonna use and put out here are gonna be mostly strictly based on Texas because I gave this talk at HomeAway with my regional manager literally yesterday, and I have all of those stats, but I guarantee you these apply across the nation. Um, from what we've actually heard, Texas is actually doing a little bit better on the computer science education than most. So, um, I think a couple of years ago there was a poll that came out that 85% of parents want their children to be learning computer science in high school or in some form of primary education. Currently today in Texas as it stands, 60% of schools do not offer a single computer science course through their entire primary school curriculum. All the way through secondary school and all of that. So no CS whatsoever. You get a typing course and how to use Word, but you don't get any sort of programming. And what ends up happening, and I give, this, I give a similar talk at uh, Texas State University, my alma mater, where I usually poll who's a math major and I tell them, congratulations, you're now a computer science educator because you're going to take this class in college and you're going to know computer science and you're going to be asked to teach this. They basically pick a random teacher who has had some sort of programming experience in their, in their collegiate career and they go, oh, you now have to teach AP Computer Science A, which is the advanced Java course that basically covers all the way through data structures and object-oriented programming, and oh, you only get one year to teach it. It's extremely difficult. I'm currently doing that right now at a school about 20 miles that way in Idea Montopolis. Um, and I will tell you right now, I came out of a program from a high school that did this, and we're talking getting from Hello World in Java to abstract classes and interfaces and being able to implement them in a timed test by the end of the school year. It's insanely difficult. So what we need is we need educators, or, we need, or what we need is we need professionals to pair with these educators who have the professional experience that can teach and help us teach not only the students, but the main goal is to help educate the teachers so that way after a couple of years, the teachers would be able to teach this class on their own without our help anymore. Um, I guess the example that we use is imagine that you had a single AP French class, or you had a single French class in college, and then you are told you are gonna, you're going to be given 10 weeks over the summer to learn French, and now you're going to be teaching French AP next semester O, and I hope all your students pass that test. That's the reality of what's happening. But what if we also said, well, also what we're going to do at the same time, we're going to put four native French speakers in your classroom, and they're going to help you not only teach the course, but they're also going to help you teach how to teach the course. Makes it a little bit easier, right? 
So that's what Teals aims to be. So there are varying levels of volunteership that you can do. I myself went in, you know, deep end with the I teach three times a week, uh, eight, eight, from eight to nine o'clock before I go to work every day. Um, you can be a teaching assistant, and that's kind of uh, at the same level. That's at the co-teach model. If you don't have that kind of time to develop, to dedicate, that's awesome. You know, I understand we all have busy lives. You could also do what's known as the lab assist model, which is where, you know, maybe the teacher has a little bit of experience in the classroom teaching this, but doesn't need like a full on co-teach environment to learn how to teach those courses. Um, so what we end up doing is you'll just be a, t a lab assistant two times a week. You come in, the teacher teaches the course, and you're there to answer questions during lab, maybe help with some of the other stuff. If that's still too much, and you don't have, like, you have very little time, they offer things, a classroom enrichment program, which basically turns into a guest lecture program where you go in every other week, maybe once a semester, and enrich the class with your experience. Any level of time you can get, they will find a place to put you. And this is not also only in person. They have an amazingly built remote classroom system that they demoed for me yesterday at my talk at HomeAway, and it's like unbelievable like this is where education is going to go in the future with remote educators and they're going to be leading the way with this tech because it's really cool so if you don't have a school in your local area and you still want to dedicate and you have this time to dedicate that's fine if you can get a webcam and a microphone they can set you up in your in your home and you can you know teach remotely so the main thing that we need here is we need people to sign up if you are interested i would say go to teals 12k.org slash volunteers or just check out the website teals 12k um, it has been worth everything. You know, like, I, it's really been worth it for me to get back in the classroom. Um, I came out of an extremely strong high school uh, computer science program. Three years in high school, computer science, high school, got all the way through computer science four and three years and did multiple competitive programming things. I have more medals that say I know Java than I care to admit. Um, also, this curriculum is not all, all Java. There are multiple classes. Java is kind of like the end course. It's the top level AP. There's a computer science principles AP course, which teaches more about what the internet is and stuff. And there's an intro course that they're piloting that they're starting just in Python, and they need Python developers to help with it. And I'm out of time. Round of applause, please. I can breathe again. Woo so I have to leave this plugged in for him. Take a deep breath. Yeah. All right, Mason, stay right there. You're going to be the prop in the next talk. Awesome. Okay, so our next talk is Carl. Carl is our videographer. So let's give Carl a round of applause for doing great video. Also, for this talk, my answer to, can you teach me some Python? Round of applause. I think I'm good. I, I used to hate that question. Now I love it because not enough hands. I whip one of these out. I whip one of those out from my backpack. I hand it to the person. They say, wow, how did it do that? Didn't do it. Yeah, it did the battery. So, oh, so now it did it. it. Whoa! Blinks. It blinks. Yeah. We did not rehearse this at all. <laughs> I have them plug it in. It's a USB thumb drive. Oh, by the way, it's an Adafruit product 3333 Circuit Playground Express. And then their file manager comes up. It's a thumb drive. Yeah. They open code.py with an editor. That's it. So if you can right click and pick open with the editor. Yep, that's, you yep. can put that over there. Put that over there. Oh, well, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> if we would just got done rehearsal, this would have worked. We're rehearsing. <sighs> and there you've got some Python code. And you can show them if you touch the things, lights turn on. And if they say, how do you make it turn off? You can talk to them about Python code. And within five minutes, they're engaged and programming. No virtual environments, no downloading, no project management, none of that boring stuff. Like even Hello World is boring compared to, hey, how did that do that? So there you go, I'm done. <laughs> Okay. Just call it. Oh. Okay, there you go. With lots of time to spare. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Mason, for stepping in. All right, so next up is Paul. And what, Paul, what's your talk? We're going to talk about uh, custom argument types with arg parse. We're going to fix your mic first. Get a little closer to your mouth. Custom arg That's types with arg parse. Okay. All right, custom arg types with arg parse. Let's give them a round of applause. So the last time I gave a lightning talk, I went for 45 minutes. So 
I wrote a, I wrote a script. I hope I can get it done in five this time. Um, so I uh, learned to use ArgParse the uh, last few months at my job, and we needed to do some custom types. Who uses ArgParse in here? Writes CLI scripts with command line arguments? Great. Um, so you can see I have some sample code here uh, showing a simple, a simple parser. I'm just going to run that. Um, and uh, there's actually several arguments that are defined. Uh, both, let's just look at a few of them. So the first one is name, and if I put in a name, Alice, um, we can see that uh, unrecognized arguments, Alice, oh, because I didn't do dash dash. <sighs> Henry. Okay, so we see I put in Alice. Uh, it's a default argument. It comes out as a string. Uh, no big deal. Um, pretty basic. If I want to say the type is going to be an integer, then I can add um, And now if I see um, the quantity is not in quotes, it's actually been converted to an int and I can use it as an int. Um, I can also define other custom arguments, argument types, if I write a method that takes a string and will return, will check the content. So here's a case where I want to have a percent type. So in my case, I want to do a percent type and it's going to be, um, uh, let me, So uh, sometimes we want to give 110% or our managers do, sorry, uh, 110 uh, must be in the range from 0 to 100. So that's the first uh, test, test we have. Uh, let's make it 50%. And so now percent has been validated to be 0 to 100 and also been converted to a float so that I can now just do direct uh, multiplication with it in my uh, function. But the, the big interesting one is that we have a lot of uh, enums in our test environment large, small, medium, uh, brief, um, and uh, testing for these arguments. We test for the name, and then we have to test for the string of the enum and so forth, and then I thought that was very clunky. I like testing using is for testing enum values. So I wrote a, uh, a mix-in to go with our enum class that allows me to use it directly, or almost directly, as an uh, argument type. And in this type, we uh, define a method that's going to take our string. It's a class method. It's going to take a string, and it's going to try to actually use the indexed access on an enum to give me back the enum that matches. If not, I get a key error, in which case I'll return uh, not valid. Um, I also have the string because what I want, I think if you notice here that if there's no color provided, we're actually getting the list of the valid colors. So I can say, say color is some bad color. It's going to say, sorry, that's not a valid color. If I can say red, then what I got was actually not the string red. I actually got the enum color dot red. Um, and then if I want to, uh, when I use that in my code, uh, I can treat it as an enum. So here I've got parse the arguments. And now I'm going to say if the color is color dot gold, I want to print pretty. And oh, I'm still doing a hard ten percent. That's not so good. Uh, color is gold, and we're pretty. That's and so that little mix in is uh, sufficient to take any enum, uh, add it as a mix-in for arc typing, and then I can treat it as an argument uh, saying type is color.argtype, and the choices are color. And uh, that's all I need to do to make that enum work as a valid arc type for arc parse. And this is a gist on GitHub, uh, gistgithub.com slash ptmcg, so you can pull it down from there. Thank you. Forty minutes.
this talk. The title's not there, so I need to look up over here. Ask him. I could ask him, but oh, okay. So Jay's going to give us a talk, building and deploying a site for beginners. Let's give him a round of applause. Hello. Okay, so uh, my journey with coding uh, has really started in 2012. It was with this, uh, 2014, with this uh, online programming class called Team Treehouse. So who here has been coding with uh, Python for about a year or less? Okay, a few, very few of us. Who knows someone that they want to tell Python that, hey, this is a good programming language you can learn about for a complete newbie? We got, we got some people, right? So how would you introduce that to them? There's some boot camps you can take in different areas, uh, in different cities, but what if you're really remote somewhere? So my journey started like with here. Um, it didn't end here, actually. But uh, what I love about this system is it's with Team Treehouse. Um, they have so many different languages. Um, I was actually on a tech degree program of theirs. Um, this is a subscription-based model, $25 a month. Uh, first, I was actually trying to be a, a full stack with JavaScript, but uh, I liked how Python is typed and how I was reading it. I actually switched over to there. And I was actually learning how to build my own website. So I'll show that to you right now. Um, and it was, it was, it started with this program, but um, I, it turned into a series of YouTube videos, which I'll show in just a moment. But this is what I built. Um, this is just, uh, I built this with Flask. Uh, I'm running this on SQLite server. I deployed it on the node. So um, and then I also use Bootstrap to design the interface. Um, it's very simple, but I have an account. I can reset my email if I don't remember it. I can uh, change my photo anytime. So for someone who you, who you want to show Python to and say, hey, you can build your own website. So who here has their own website? Who here has designed it and built it on their own? Good. Yeah, so that's the power of uh, Python. And, and if, if, if you know someone who wants to demonstrate their work, um, this could be the place for it. So what ended up happening was I didn't need to use Team Treehouse. Actually, there is this guy. I think he's the best um, as far as step-by-step -step tutorials on YouTube. It's free. OK, he does. Uh, he starts actually with a lot of uh, basic Python language uh, concepts. And in his videos, uh, it's kind of a rabbit hole. like. For example, uh, what is a, a closure? Before that, he talks about what is a first class function. And before that, he talks about um, what is a decorator, or something like that in that order. So uh, he has this amazing class tutorial series, and there's also a, a Django tutorial series that it's about maybe five to six hours total. But uh, me, I love to dive into things deep uh, when I'm looking at them. So um, it ended up being maybe 10 hours from total. But this will get you from zero to knowing how to access Linux, build SSH, encrypt, and make your site secure, uh, because that's kind of a complicated process. This should not be so, but uh, it was. But that's OK. Um, I also have, uh, um, so, so with that, um, what I learned along the way, um, just for someone like me who's learning, um, you know, Python, really on my own. Um, I've, I've been using OneNote to build a glossary. I know there's a glossary and there's documentation online already for these different packages. But what I've done is sometimes I, I just say things in my own words. So for example, you can see here, I was trying to learn about Flash SQL Alchemy. Uh, before that, I actually was reading just about SQL Alchemy itself. So um, uh, this is what I would use as reference because instead of having to access the website, I can do this offline. And uh, like I said, it's in my own words. I also put down procedures there. Um, and so that was a lot of help. Um, next, um, this is, I don't know if anybody uses this, but at least for Windows, um, this is a great command line interface called Commander. You can have multiple tabs open. Um, this is in PowerShell. You can just also add um, another one. Let's say it's a command, Commander. So um, that can be there as well. You can have all these tabs open and available. Um, and I've been using GitHub for my code. And apart from that, uh, I just have to say, uh, I did a lot of this on my own in my house, in coffee shops. Um, 
So if, you're, if you know someone who wants to learn this language, um, they can learn it online and actually do it pretty much for free at the start, but eventually you want to get to know people, and that's what I did. So um, that's why I'm here. I just found out about this convention two days ago. So that is all for me. <laughs> Hello again, everybody. Um, this will be a quick talk. I get this question a lot of times, being a test guy, and I gave the whole talk about EGAD, how do we write better tests? So which one is better, unit test or pie test? What should we pick for writing our tests? Um, before I give my personal opinion of answer, I want to just compare the two uh, and just kind of shake out things. So. Has everyone seen the Python developer survey from 2018? Yes, no, maybe? Yeah, yeah, if you haven't, just Google it. It gives a whole bunch of cool statistics on uh, the Python developer community. That was done in collaboration with the Python Software Foundation as well as JetBrains. Um, if you look at that survey, it's interesting. Uh, of the people who are using uh, test frameworks of Python, 46% use PyTest, whereas only 32% use UnitTest. Um, UnitTest is pretty nice. Uh, the best thing about unit test is that it comes with a standard library. You don't need to install anything extra. It's there from the get-go. There is nothing wrong or particularly bad about unit test. Um, however, when you look at PyTest, PyTest is a little bit more powerful and a little bit cleaner. When you write your tests in PyTest, you can write them as functions, whereas in unit test, it shoehorns you into a class structure. Um, personally, I prefer the functional style of writing test functions. Um, some other things, with PyTest, you get those fixtures that are more reusable. Um, you also can scope fixtures to a, the, that individual test level versus module level. It's really nice. And PyTest also has plugins galore. If there's a, a plugin for something you want, it, PyTest probably has it. If you want parallel execution, PyTest Exodus. If you want code coverage, PyTest Co. Uh, if you want uh, integrations with Django or Flask, it's there. And I also just want to shout out, in case you missed it, Nose is dead. I strongly recommend not using the NOSE framework. So now to my opinions. Um, overall, I think Python is one of the best languages for test automation, period. Uh, it's because it's Pythonic. It's easy to pick up for beginners and powerful for power users. I also personally think PyTest is one of the best frameworks in any language, particularly because it has test functions, because of its plugins, and also because of its fixtures. It's a very, very nifty way of handling things. Uh, personally, I also like PyTest BDD too. Uh, Py, uh, BDD, Behavior Driven Development. If you don't know what that is, I recommend you look it up. It's a really cool way to write tests. And so with all that to say, personally, I prefer PyTest over unit test. Thank you. Yeah. All right, let's give uh, Ernest a round of applause. All right. Hello, uh, I'm Ernest. I like the bicycle because it makes you feel strong and beautiful. Um, I also work for the Python Software Foundation. If you're not aware of what the Python Software Foundation is, we're going to do that really quickly. First off, it is a legal entity that takes care of the copyright, trademark, uh, and intellectual property for the Python programming language. Um, we also support the Python community via infrastructure, both technical and fiscal. From a technical perspective, it's things like python.org and pypi.org. Um, from a fiscal perspective, we can support any project um, that aligns with our mission. Uh, by letting them sort of hang out under the umbrella of our 501c3 status. We also uh, provide grants worldwide, um, over $300,000 in counting and sort of going up with time, and 75% of those grants are distributed outside of the U.S. Um, those grants go to things like the Django Girls, PyLadies Workshops, um, meetups, and regional uh, Python conferences like, uh, like uh, there's one in Texas, what's it called? Yeah, oh, PyTexas, right. Um, uh, additionally, the PSF puts on PyCon every year. Um, if you're not aware of what PyCon is, uh, PyCon is a conference that happens in, uh, I think it's Cleveland, uh, Texas. So it's only, it's only three hours uh, from here. Oh, so I, I'm sorry, it's actually in Cleveland, Arkansas. Um, so it's, it's eight, nine hours from here. Uh, oh, uh, Tennessee, Cleveland, Tennessee, which is th 14 hours from here? 16, oh, here we go. Okay, so Cleveland, Ohio. Um, so it's a 20-hour it's drive. 
Um, <laughs> and it's not too late to come. Uh, and as a matter of fact, if you want, you could just like caravan with me. I'm heading back that way in my car uh, after Pi Texas, so you could just get in your car and come along with me. Um, but sincerely, there are some tickets left for PyCon if you haven't made um, arrangements yet. And uh, in, pre in preparation for this lightning talk, I realized that next time I do a road trip, there are a lot of Clevelands I could go see. <laughs> All right, round of applause. Introduce you, and then you can, you can go. Uh, so this is Micah. Micah put his talk title as Senior Network Security Infrastructure Engineer. I think that's your title. I thought I was asking my title, not my talk's title. I was confused why there wasn't another field. I thought you'd want to know what the talk was about, too. So I went back to edit it, and there was no other field. So yeah. anyway, that's who I am. All right, so the talk is actually, uh, it's not how could this happen to me, either. No, it isn't. It's Python Unicode Adventures. Let's give them a round of applause. So spoiler alert, this talk is recycled, and also you're getting the five minute version of a 30 minute talk. Uh, but anyway, this is about uh, Unicode and the problems that I've had with it. And uh, just the simple fact, uh, first of all, not doing live coding demo here. Um, these are the kinds of problems that you run into trying to deal with uh, Unicode versus ASCII in Python. Uh, the long and short of it is that back in the day we all used ASCII and Python was built back in the day and it still wants to use ASCII most of the time. The hilarious thing about this particular error is that the uh, program crashes while trying to print a Unicode character and then successfully prints the Unicode character in the stack trace. Um, now you may have noticed you may have noticed that the problem here is that I'm using Python 2 now if you're uh, like me and you have to maintain some legacy code it's a fact of life you have to live with it and at least not break things that were already working. But assuming that you switch over to Python 3, that should fix all of your problems, right? Because Python 3 uses Unicode by default instead of ASCII. So it's a lot simpler, we just print, and we get the same crash, and now in Python 3 it fails to print the stack trace correctly. So um, I'm not sure that I have time to get through all of the reasons why this is a problem and continues to be a problem in 2019, so let me see if I can give you the short version. ASCII was nice because it skipped a lot of steps. We had a direct mapping of characters to numbers, and those numbers were all one byte. Um, with Unicode, though, things get a little more complicated. Um, we have direct mappings of characters to numbers, but those numbers are not mapped directly to bytes. There are actually a lot of different types of encoding that you can get for Unicode. Some of them represent all characters, well, not all characters. Some of them represent more characters than others. And the one that you're going to be using most of the time is going to be uh, UTF-8, uh, which will... Uh, I don't know what's going on here. It's some problem with it. I think you got some Unicode in here. <laughs> you know what? I would explain it. Uh, so anyway, uh, when you're working in Python specifically, Unicode is a type. It's a type of variable. Uh, although, if you're on Python 3, skipping over a bunch of stuff here. Uh, this is the nice little disambiguation table uh, that, uh, that you should use. Um, basically, in Python 3, strings by default are representations of Unicode code points. So they don't map directly to bytes until they have to. Uh, in other words, until you're outputting them to something outside of the Python language, like a file, or your terminal, or the network. Uh, and at the point where you have to convert a uh, Python Unicode object into some bytes, you have to go through your uh, encoding and you have to basically settle on what, uh, how that character should be represented in bytes. Um, according to the official uh, Python how-to on how to use Unicode in your code, uh, basically don't care about uh, encodings as much as possible. Just use the built-in uh, Unicode objects that the language gives you internally and let the interpreter handle the uh, encoding when it needs to talk to something else. But as we saw earlier, that actually doesn't work a lot of times. Um, you can handle the encoding yourself manually by using .encode or .decode on your string objects. Um, to make a long story short, Python does its best to detect the preferred encoding of the file it's writing to. 
Um, so when you're running a script in a terminal, it's going to actually ask the terminal, hey terminal, what kind of encoding do you want? I don't know why it's doing that. Um, and so the reason that, uh, the reason we can still get this crash, uh, even on Python 3, is that it's possible to misconfigure your terminal. If any of you have worked inside of, um, you know, like Docker containers, for example, if you just build like the default Debian Docker container, and you go in there and you try to use Unicode, you may get a crash, because out of the box, it doesn't have a lot of uh, environment variables set. And there's one in particular, here we go, LCC type is an environment variable that is going to signal to not only Python, but to a lot of programs, what type of encoding they should use when they're talking to the system. And so if you explicitly tell it that it should use ASCII, uh, then it's gonna try to use ASCII and it's gonna fail to print this multi-byte number in one byte. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the long and short of my talk, or I guess the short of my talk, five minute version anyway. And there are further problems if you try to do this in SSH. All right, round of applause. And on that note... Okay, so Jeremy's gonna give us a talk about making high taxes happen. Yeah. Legally. Legally. All right, cool. All right. So, uh, you, some of you may have been coming to PyTex for a while. Uh, we might be the oldest regional Python conference uh, in the U.S. at least. Uh, apparently the question is whether Pi Ohio happened earlier or later in the year in 2007. Uh, that's like the, the question about who is actually the um, the first regional. Anyway, so we started out as Pi Camp, Texas, and then uh, two years later adopted the name Pi, Texas, uh, and then for a few years we carried along and uh, then in, until 2012, the important thing to note is there was one person running this group, uh, running the whole thing, okay? Which is okay because it was actually only a couple dozen people that would come to each year, uh, each one. I think I started coming in 2010 uh, and there were like 30 or 40 of us uh, in Waco. Um, and then as we grew, it became more and more difficult for people to, uh, for w this one person to do it. It was Sheila Allen, if you, if you know her. Um, so in 2013, Sheila kind of backed away and we had a group uh, organize it for the first time ever. Uh, and that group also decided to start charging because we would have people say, yeah, sure, I'm coming, and then they wouldn't come. Uh, and that, by the way, is the primary reason why uh, people pay to go to the conference. Um, so uh, that led to a problem, right? If we're gonna take money, uh, including sponsor dollars, how do we do that? Uh, well, uh, as Ernest just mentioned, the PSF jumped in and helped us out with uh, funding. We could send our funds to the PSF and then they would reimburse us for our charges. Uh, and that worked out really well, except it took a while. And everybody had to put dollars, you know, like we, you know, we would get reimbursed and all that. So, um, and also uh, the logistics have improved greatly in the last five years, uh, in the last two years. Uh, but it just took, it was kind of a problematic process for us. Uh, so we thought it would be easy and we decided to just do it ourselves. Uh, so in 2014, we founded uh, the Pi Texas Foundation, which is a registered nonprofit corporation here in Texas. Uh, and the next year we got the Department of the Treasury to agree that we're a 501c3 uh, because if we ever go under, any profits that we make will actually go to another nonprofit. Uh, guess which one it would go to. Um, and uh, then uh, we even got, come on. This actually, I don't know why that would be challenging. Cool. Uh, well, you can see it here. I don't know why you can't see it up there. But <laughs> we got a logo. It's blue and it's yellow and it's in the shape of Texas. And we actually talked to the Python, the PSF logo committee because they have, for very good reasons, have protected their trademarks. Uh, and they actually said they like this one. So that's nice. Um, so anyway, here's, here's the world since then. Uh, we were in College Station again in 2014, we get our 501c3, and boom, we're in uh, 2019 now. So, what's the governance of the, of the Pi Texas Foundation? There's a board of directors, currently there are three of us. Uh, there are four officerships uh, that are sort of mandated uh, by our bylaws. Um, interestingly, if you think that, if you note that there are three boards of, three directors and four officers, uh, that means that one person is doing two people's jobs. Uh, and the good news is we can grow our board. Um, so we have some committees, for example, for the conference, uh, semi-annual meetings, that's all. Um, so we're interested in 
for building support for the foundation. It is not you know, uh, that much work. Um, it's mostly coming to meetings and making sure that you sign things. Uh, so if you're at all interested in the foundation, and I'm talking to some of you who've been around in the community for a while, and also some of you who are brand new, who could bring new ideas to, the, to it, uh, we're really interested in, in hearing from you. Um, can't promise a board seat, but I can promise that we will find a way to, to, to uh, let you contribute to the community. Um, so let us know. Show up at meetings. They're on Google Hangouts. It's not hard. Um, and really, that's it. Um, and then one last thing that I think is important, but Google doesn't, uh, is, um, man, it really doesn't like, so the, the foundation is not the conference. Every year, kind of a new group of people could work on the conference. Um, there's, a, there's a standing committee that, that has worked on it, but, but they're not at all the same. So I think Dustin tomorrow is going to be talking about how to contribute to the conference, which is a much more immediate need every year. Um, but that, the foundation and the conference are not the same. I'm really glad you took the picture of the broken slide. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. And that's it. That's it for me. Thanks. All right. Try it. Okay. We're gonna get this done. <laughs> this is gonna be really awkward, but it's gonna work. And in order to give this talk, you're gonna have to direct your attention to the other screen. No, it'll, it'll be on this <laughs> one. It'll be on the screen right here. Sorry, on the screen. I mean, to be fair, the screencast did work when I, the moment I sat down. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is going to be hard. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> You're going to see something. <laughs> OK. All right, let's give Josh a round of applause for his crazy, crazy time. Is this working? Everyone turn your heads. <laughs> <laughs> this is as good as it's going to get, all right? <laughs> there we go. Okay, so when I showed up today, I wasn't exactly planning on giving a lightning talk, but over lunch, I was talking to Aloy, and I was showing this really cool terminal emulator program, and he was like, oh, you, sh you, sh you should present on this. There are a lot of guys that like hacking with Python, and I go, oh, that that's fair. And I know when you're not surrounded by other people who are enthusiastic about Python or actually developing on your own computers, that you might kind of get the itch to develop in Python. Well, th th this can kind of scratch that. Here we have our, our uh, handy dandy REPL. Boom, there we are. We are at home on your Android device using Termux on our phone. I mean, we can do simple things. You want to do some minor uh, subtraction, there it is. You're like, oh. That's pretty cool, Sorensen. But what if I want to develop on my phone? Like, I, I really want to develop. And I said, oh, I, I hear you. OK. So here we are. We're, we're running in a Tmux session. So I can just simply transfer over to another window. And I go, OK, uh, I, I want to write something. So I'm going to pull up my faithful uh, Emacs client. And I'm going to open my little uh, Python development project. And this I cobbled together over lunch. It's a small. Uh, uh, script that takes in a user input. Oh, is this is this mirrored? Yeah. Oh God. Okay. <laughs> well, it, it 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 takes in a user input and translates it to a Morse code and then vibrates the phone. It does a little system OS call in Morse code, just because. Um, and so I'm not I'm not going to do any of this live. So we'll we'll switch over to another uh, Tmux window, and go and call our, our little uh, Morse generator through Python. Well, that's, that's pretty cool. There we go. Now it's running and it's asking for our input. Well, let's see what I can spell sideways. Let's see if there's a Pi Texas. Eh, Pi works, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and then we run it and you can't feel it, but I can. My phone's vibrating and it's punching out the Morse code there. So if you're ever just needing to develop in public, there you go. <laughs> That's all I got. That's it. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> all right. We only have one last thing to do. Actually, two last things to do. Okay.
so I'm gonna I'm gonna raffle off, not raffle, to the speakers. I'm gonna give to one of the speakers. Hold on. To one of the speakers, I'm gonna give this lovely water bottle that is our speaker's gift, by the way. So if, uh, if next year you become a speaker, get a talk accepted at the conference, submit a CFP, uh, you might win maybe not this exact water bottle, but something quite nice like it. Uh, as our appreciation for all the speakers that have done a really excellent job giving a talk today. Uh, we don't have enough for all the Lightning Talk speakers. We have one for one of them. So we're just going to, I don't know why I'm showing it twice, we're just going to random that choice this right now and see who it is. That's Andy. Andy, congratulations. <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank you to all the Lightning Talk speakers. Thanks for all the talks today. We have a whole.